Now let's look at another example, which is this kind of a periodic square wave. Right. So 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 this is some kind of schematic diagram about what this kind of square wave actually looks like. It's a, first of all, it's a symmetric with respect to zero. Right. The horizontal axis is uh, is here. That's the horizontal axis denoted by n. Right. And the the square wave is basically symmetric with uh, with respect to uh, n equals to zero. You see, so 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 the non-zero part, the the part that's uh, has an amplitude of one, goes from minus n one to positive n one. Right. That's the non-zero part. But the period of this square wave, the fundamental period of this square wave, is not just uh, this uh, non-zero part. Right. It's actually if you want to count the number, uh, the, the the period, you have to sort of, sort of, for example, if you take this stick as a reference, right, this particular stick as a reference, you have to look at the next stick that's here, right. So the period of this wave, the fundamental period of this square wave, is actually big N, right. So the stick in the center is here, right. That's that's N equal to zero, and then the next one is at big N, right. So that's the period. So so if you want to sort of Make this kind of wave in MATLAB. They will look like that, right? So, so, so the horizontal axis is small n, right? And then uh, it's symmetric with respect to n equals zero, and it has amplitude unity of amplitude of unity for those uh, segments, right? And then amplitude of zero for these alternating segment segments. So, for this particular for this particular example, you can sort of see n1, big n1, n1 actually equals to 2, right, because uh, because uh, this is 0, right, and then this is 1, and then this is 2, so big n1 actually equals to 2, right, and then what's actually the fundamental period, right, the fundamental period, if you look at the center stick here, when do you actually get the next center stick, it's right here, right, it's right here, this, this stick, this stick actually at location 9, See, because here it's 10, this is 10, so this is 9, right? So the fundamental period is actually 9, right? And the code for making this particular square wave, this periodic square wave, looks like that. So big N, the fundamental period, equals to 9. And then N1, big N1, equals to 2, right? So N1 equals to 2, fundamental period is 9. And then what I did is that uh, I generated X0. X0 is basically just a one period. It's just a one period of this uh, square wave, right? Because it has a length of big N. That's one period, right? And then I fill it up with uh, with zeros. And then I generate the horizontal axis. So the horizontal axis should go from like a minus N subtract one divided by two to N big N sub subtract one divided by two. So 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 x one x zero basically goes from minus four to positive four, right? So that's exactly nine sticks, right? So so the so x zero has exactly same length as x zero, right? And for those, and then I need to sort of set the amplitude for this square wave, right? And the amplitude is non-zero only from minus n one to positive n one, right? Minus n1 to a positive n1. This 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 period is kind of a, uh, this uh, this um, this interval can be determined using ABS x0 smaller than n1, smaller than or equal to n1, big n1, right? So for 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 for, for horizontal axis that satisfies this particular condition. For indices for indices of x0 that satisfies this particular condition, I switch the amplitude of the wave x0 to 1, right? And then x is just uh, repeating x0, this one period, by like five times, right? And then I generate the horizontal axis for this uh, for this periodic wave, right? For th this periodic wave just have like a five periods in it, but uh, in principle it's actually infinite, infinite long, right? And then if I make a plot of nx and x0, I will get this wave, right, this plot. So, so now let's look at the, the Fourier series for this particular square wave, right? For this particular square wave example. Again, it is actually possible to evaluate the Fourier series coefficients 
analytically for this particular example. So, so if we look back, if we look back, what's our, what's our analysis equation? That's our analysis equation, right? So a k equals to one over big n, big n. That's the number of samples for one period, right? And then sum over n, x n goes from uh, e to the minus jk, 2 pi divided by big n times n, and n goes from minus infinity to positive infinity. No, no, uh, n actually goes from, uh, n is actually in, uh, for, for just one period, one period of this periodic wave, n is, um, so, so, so now let's just, uh, let's just uh, use this formula, use this particular formula to, to compute the Fourier series coefficients for our square wave, right, for our square wave. So how am I going to do that? All right, how am I going to do that? The equation is basically the same, right? But xn equals to 1, only from minus n1 to positive n1, and equal to 0 for every other locations within one period, right? So, so, so all I have to do, if I, in this equation, if I, if I replace xn, if I replace xn with 1, with 1, with just 1, then it's just one times this complex exponential, right? And xn equals to one only when n goes from minus n1 to positive n1. So all I have to do is to change the summation range to to from uh, to, to go from minus n1 to positive n1, and then replace xn with its amplitude, which is a one, right? Because outside of that interval, minus n1 to n1, xn has zero amplitude, right? So that equation essentially becomes this thing, right? So n goes from minus n1 to positive n1, and then e to the minus jk 2 pi divided by big n times n, right? Now I can change the summation index. Now I can change the summation index. So 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 I'll I'll replace n with m, right? So 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 n I'll I'll replace n with m subtract big n1. Right, so n is replaced with m subtract big n1, and then m is gonna have a range not going from minus n1 to n1 anymore. It's going from zero to two n1. Right. So so m subtract n1 goes from minus n1 to n1. Right. So if you do this um, do this uh, switch of indexes, replace 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 n with m subtract n big N1, then you can change the summation to this particular form, right, M goes from 0 now, now the starting index, the start, the index starts from 0 instead of a minus N1, right, and then I can take this uh, minus N1 out of this summation because this minus N1 times e to the minus jk 2 pi divided by big N does not depend upon M, you see, the summation index is m, but this thing doesn't depend on m, so I can take this thing out outside of the summation. So, so what I get is here, right? So one divided by big n, one divided by big, big n, and then e to the jk two pi divided by jk two pi divided by big n times big n one, big n one. It's minus minus cancels out, right? And then this, the the stuff left in the summation is just m goes from zero to two n one, and then e to the minus jk two pi divided by big n times m, right? So this becomes our summation. And at this point, we can utilize the geometric series, right? The geometric geometric series result. If you guys don't exactly remember uh, what geometric series actually tells us, it's like that. That's the geometric series, right? So n goes from 0 to big n subtract 1, r over n, equals to either big n when r over equals to 1, or equals to 1 subtract r over 1 subtract r over to the big n's power when r is not equal to zero uh, to, to one, right? So 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 in our geometric series, series we need to identify what's our r and then what's our big n, right? Or big n subtractor one. What exactly is our big n subtractor one, right? So so the summation that we are trying to in, uh, evaluate is this thing, is this particular summation, right? So the r is identified like that. It's e to the minus jk two pi divided by big n, right? That's our r right? The, the this thing, this part, this part without the m, right? Without. 
and then what's our summation range? 0 to 2n1. So big N subtract 1 equals to 2n1. Right? So so in this in this particular form, the, the the power here, the power here is actually the summation, the upper range of the summation index plus one. Right. Right. Do you see? The upper range of the summation index is n subtract one here, and then the power is this summation index big N subtract one plus one, right? So it's one. So 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 in our case that's our arva, right? That's our arva, and then arva raised by two n one plus one. This this is supposed to be our uh, our power, right? So so one subtract arva, one subtract arva, one subtract arva to the two n one plus one's power. That's here, right? two n one plus n's power, right? And this is when the arva is not equal to zero, uh, to one. When alpha is not equal to one, means what? Means k is not equal to zero or positive minus big N, positive minus two big N, right? This, this, uh, when k is not equal to this thing, we have this uh, result from the geometric series summation, right? And then we can do some rearrangements. Arrange the nominator and denominator, taking out some common factors, taking out some common factors, right? And uh, what's, if we, if we take out this common factor, and then take into account this uh, this complex exponential, we can rearrange the terms into into this particular form, right? And the reason I want to put the f put the equation into this particular form is because uh, it's a complex exponential with uh, these two are actually conjugate to each other. You see, it's conjugating to each other. These two terms are conjugating to each other also, right? <coughs> because the face is like uh, the same, the face is the same, except uh, with the minus sign here, no minus sign here. The face is the same, with a minus sign here, but no minus sign here, right? So, so if you do this kind of subtraction, do this kind of subtraction, what you are actually getting out of this thing is the sign. This factor is the same for nominator and uh, numerator and the denominator. Right, so you can cancel them out, but these two subtracting each other gives you a sign, right? Gives you a sign. These two subtracting each other gives you another sign, right? It's essentially two times. It's actually two j times sign this thing, and then two j times sign this thing, right? But the two j and two j cancels out on the numerator and denominator, right? So you get this thing. It's basically two sine functions dividing each other. And uh, this this formula holds when k is not equal to zero, positive minus big n, positive minus big two big n, right? And when k actually equals to these these values, equals to these uh, multiples of big n, then then the geometric series this summation has a different formula, right? It's it's basically two n one plus one divided by big n, right? Because in that case, r equals equal to, to 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 one. R equals to one. Right, alpha equals to one. Then the summation gives you big N, right? Big N is a. Uh, in our case, the range of the summation goes from zero to two N one. So, so it's two times N one, right? The summation value is two times N one. Two two times N one plus one actually two times N one plus one divided by big N, because you have divided by big N here. Right? So for these two situations, K is the not e can not equal to this these values and k equal to these values. These two situations can be combined together. Actually, if you combine these two situations together, you can write big N times a k equals to this sine function divided by this sine function. <coughs> Here we have introduced a big omega. Big omega equals to what? Big omega equals to two pi k divided by big N. So it's basically integer k times 2 pi divided by big N, <laughs> right? So, so big omega, you can think of a big omega as a s even sample of the horizontal, of the frequency axis, right? And the interval of the sampling 
is 2 pi divided by big N. And then all the samples on this axis is just the integer times 2 pi divided by big N. Right? 2 pi divided the integer times this particular interval. 2 pi divided by big N. Right? And then k is just an any integer k is just any integer it doesn't have to be this value it doesn't have to be this value right this so 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 this 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 formula actually is applicable for both kinds of situations both kinds of situations you see now let's look at the, the matlab codes matlab codes for 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 implementing the Fourier transform right so we have two different ways for computing the Fourier series coefficients right one is the analytical way that we have de derived from, from, from these equations, right? And another is just the, the, the application of this particular formula, which, which can be implemented using just the matrix vector modifications, right? right. So we are going to do the compute the discrete Fourier series, AK, in both ways, and then we are going to compare, compare if, uh, if, uh, if they are identical, right? That's the first thing we're going to try to do. So, 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 so here it's a, uh, it's the, big N is the fundamental period nine, right? And then big N one is uh, the the half of the range within which the wave has uh, amplitude of one, right? And then here I'm, I was constructing the the periodic wave with just the five periods. Right, periodic square wave with just the five periods. One, the, fun, the one period is just the x zero, right? And its horizontal axis is x zero. So, so let's see if we can actually construct our uh, Fourier series by using Fourier series coefficients by using this particular equation, right? And uh, We'll try to do it. We'll try to do it uh, by by just uh, using this uh, matrix vector multiplication that I was showing you guys uh, last time. It's uh, so so x zero x zero is essentially x n, right? That's just the one period of this periodic square wave because x zero I constructed x zero to be just the one period of this periodic square wave, right? So x zero. Right, that's x n, and then I have to multiply this thing. This thing, this is a vector, right? And then we need to construct this as a matrix. This exponential, complex exponential, as a matrix. So it's a exponential minus one j, one i. It's just minus j, and then two pi divided by big n times n, and then you have a k here, right? We know that n is supposed to be just a one period. The interval of just the one period of that wave, period of wave. So we know that n is supposed to be just n x zero, right? And then what's going to be k, right? What's going to be k? What's going to be the k, right? K can be k is supposed to be actually the same length as n x zero. So we just put n x zero to k, right? But you can actually just use k also equals to another vector that has exactly the same length as x zero, right? It's also fine. It doesn't have to be um, exactly equal to x zero. Right. So, so if we actually do this calculation, then we get the numerical values for the Fourier series coefficients, right? And then the codes here. Is actually the analytic solutions, right? The analytic solutions we have derived here. Right. So, so here, big O. So this is actually a symbol of O. It's not zero. Zero actually looks like that, with a dot in the middle, right? But this is O, big O. Big O represents big omega, basically. So, so big O equals two pi times k divided by big N, right? And then B, B is going to be our analytical result of the Fourier series coefficients, right? So, so, so B is supposed to be equal to 
this particular value divided by big N, right? It's the sign 2N1 plus 1, 2N1 plus 1 times big O divided by 2. Dot divide sign big O divided by 2, and then divide by big N, right? So for this particular formula to hold, right? For this particular formula to hold, um, big O, no, no, sign big O cannot be equal to zero, right? Because you are dividing it, dividing it. So if it's zero, then you get another number, right? And uh, when big O actually equals to zero, it means what? It means that small k, small k actually equals to these values, right? And when small k equals to these values, a k is supposed to equal to that. So here I'm actually changing it. So if for for those indices where b is not a number, that's when big O equals to zero, and then that's when k equals to these values. I change the value of b. I change the value of b to, to be two n one plus one divided by b n. Right. So this way I get the analytical result. That's b. Right. So 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 let's let's make a plot and look at the, if they are identical. Let's make a plot. Um, so this is our square wave in the time domain, right? And then let's look at the coefficients, for series coefficients. I'll open another plot. So here I'm actually plotting the numerical results A times big N. It's uh, numerical results A big times big N. And it's supposed to be in blue, I think. Default value, default color is blue. And then I'm plotting B, that's the analytic result, times big N. And the color is in red. So if they are indeed identical, then I'm not supposed to see any blue colors, blue sticks. I'm not supposed to see any blue sticks, right, if they are identical. Because I hold on the, to the plot, so, right. So let's just uh, make a plot of it. And you can see it's uh, indeed the same, exactly the same, right? You don't see any blue sticks. It's uh, it's all red sticks, right? right. So so that's uh, that's the first part of this particular example. We are basically comparing we are basically comparing numerical results with the analytical results, right? Now. Now let's uh, let's look at uh, two different effects. One of the effects is is the synthesis equation. So here we have a set of k, right? We have a set of k, and k actually equals to what? K actually equals to so from minus four to positive four here. So let's, and uh, to, to get the original time domain signal back, you need to sum over all the k with the coefficients a k times this complex exponential, right? But let's look at the, the effect of partial summation. Suppose we sum over just the k equals to zero. We just include just the one term that's equals to, that's for k equals to zero into the summation. And forget about everything else. Forget about every other terms, k equals to uh, positive or minus 1, positive minus 2, that kind of thing, right? Just include one term. Then what's going to be the signal that we're going to recover, right? So that's this piece of code here. So C, the, the reason I define a C here is to, is to, is to, is to get, because the, the MATLAB matrix the MATLAB vector indexes doesn't start from negative values, you see. It starts from 1. So in order to actually retrieve the center point, it's not e it's not k0. If you type k0, it's not going to give you the right value, right? If you want to if you want to get the value here, you have to it's a 1 2 3 4 5. It's actually the fifth value, right? It's actually k to the fifth value. So 5 is what? 5 is actually 0. That's the that's the real k k index that we want plus a reference, right? Plus a reference. The reference here it's c. C c is n subtract one. That's nine 
divided by 9 subtract 1, that's 8, right? 8 divided by 2, that's 4. 4 plus 1, that's 5, right? 0 plus 5. So, so, so C is going to be our index shift, the amount of shift for the index in order to retrieve the correct value. So when k equal to 0, what we want is actually a0 times e to the j0 times 2 pi divided by n times n, right? right? And pick a0 in our MATLAB matrix, in our MATLAB vector, it's a, right? A and then what's going to be the index? It's going to be C plus K. Right? It's going to be C plus K. And then times this uh, complex exponential, e to the j 1, one i, k times 2 pi divided by big n times n x, right? Because k, k here actually equals 0. So let's let's make a plot of it. Let's make another plot. So maybe I should just... Uh, And now let's look at the, this, uh, this, this particular plot. So the blue sticks was the was our original was our original square wave, right? Periodic square wave. And then the red sticks is actually the synthesis equation, including just the one term that's k at k equal to zero. You can sort of see when k equal to zero, k equal to zero here, it's basically just a constant. It's a DC component of this particular square wave, right? So, so suppose we actually take the average of this pure, periodic square wave. The average of it is going to look more or less like that, right? It's going to be 0.5, right? It's either 0 or 1, 0 or 1. So you sort of do a summation and then divide by sort of the period. The period is not exactly... So the, the number of samples with zero amplitude is not exactly the same as the number of samples uh, you, with with amplitude exactly equals to one. So if you average them, it's not exactly 0.5, right? So you can sort of see it's a, it's a slightly bigger than 0.5 actually. So, so but, but but that's sort of the DC component, right? When k equals to zero, that's the DC component. And then let's let's consider the first when k equals to one and k equals to minus one. Right, we add two more terms. Two more terms. This one has just the k equals to zero terms. But this one x one equals to x zero, x zero. That's the DC component. Plus, plus two more terms actually. Two more terms. One is for k equals to positive one, and then one another one is for k equal to minus one. See. Again. We have to shift the index a little bit by using C. See here, because the MATLAB doesn't have negative index. Right. And then let's look at what's going to happen. Let's look at what's going to happen. So this is a blue is still the original periodic square wave. Red sticks are the synthesis equation with three terms included, right? Three terms, the three terms corresponding to k equals to zero and then k equals to positive minus one, right? So now you can sort of see that it's not just the, the DC component anymore. You actually have positive and negative values, actually. You have overshoots, right? This is overshooting. And then this is another overshoot, right? Downshoot, basically. Overshoot, downshoot, right? But you can sort of see the shape actually matches better. It's not just a, a uniform amplitude. Now you have you have this kind of a better match, better match to the original shape of the periodic square wave, right? Better match. This is by including just the three terms, right? Let's let's include more terms now. Let's, this is a positive minus one. Let's do positive minus two. Positive minus two, k equals to two, positive two, and k equals to minus two. Let's include two more terms, right? And then let's see what's going to happen. 
you can imagine, right? You can imagine. It's going to be a bit of fit. It's going to be a bit of fit to the observed, uh, to, to the original waves. The overshoot or the downshoot, uh, the overshoot is actually becoming less, but the downshoot sort of is, a, is a increasing, actually. So, right. Two more terms. Let's keep increasing. Let's keep increasing the number of terms included. Now let's do three. K equals to positive n minus three. Right. Even better match, right? Even better match. Now let's do k equals to positive n minus four, including all the terms basically. It's including more all the terms. And now you can see, so you see it's a perfect fit, right? It's a perfect fit. See. If you have studied continuous time for a series for a transform before, you probably have heard about the Gibbs phenomena, right? Gibbs phenomena is some kind of a uh, overshooting downshooting problem. That's kind of overshooting problem, especially for this kind of square wave. You're gonna see overshoots at the corners, the overshoots at the corners, right? The overshoots at the corners. But for this kind of discrete, discrete time series, discrete time periodic series, you don't see this kind of overshoot anymore, right? You don't see it. You don't see the Gibbs phenomena. There's no Gibbs phenomena, right? The reason is that for continuous Fourier transforms, the frequency axis is actually continuous, right? The frequency axis is continuous. So it doesn't matter how many terms you are going to add. You can add infinite many. You can add like a extremely large number of frequencies to the synthesis equation, but you are still going to miss some of the frequencies because the frequency is unif is is a continuous, right? There's no way that you can sort of capture all the different all the frequencies. It's continuous, right? But for discrete, but for discrete Fourier transforms, it's not the same case, right? The frequency is, is actually discrete. It's discrete k, right? So k actually can equal to either, uh, for this particular case, k just has like a nine different values from minus four to positive four, right? So it's possible to for you to actually capture all the frequency contents. Right? There's nothing actually missing. In the continuous frequency of in the continuous Fourier transform case, it's not the same thing. Frequency axis is continuous, right? By taking just a, a few discrete samples, you are not going to capture all the frequencies. It's, even even you add like a one million or one billion, there are many frequencies. There's still some frequencies are missing. So so you you have those kind of overshoots because uh, some of the frequency content is still missing, right? But for discrete time series, it's not the same. It's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. And uh, that's that's the first thing I would like to uh, uh, demonstrate, right? I would like to demonstrate. And there's a second thing. There's a second thing that I would like to show you guys. The second thing that I would like to show you guys is is about this particular equation. It's about this particular equation. So. So for now, big N actually equals to nine. That's the fundamental fundamental period of this particular square wave. Suppose suppose I want to sort of increase the period, the fundamental period, right? I want to sort of pull apart all those uh, non-zero sticks uniformly by increasing the fundamental period. Right? Suppose it's no longer nine. I want to use 11, 11, 21, 41, that kind of thing. I want to increase the fundamental period. Big N1 is still holding constant. So so the width of the non-zero part is still fixed, but I'm extending the period, increasing the fundamental period from 9 to 11, 21, 41, that kind of thing. So basically, if I if I increase the fundamental period from 9 to 11, then these two, these two blocks, these two non-zero blocks is going to be further apart from the center block, right? You can imagine in your head what's going to happen, right? If we, if I increase it to like 11, then this this block is shifted to the right side, 
by like a uh, two samples, right? And then this block is shifted to the left side by like two samples, right? So 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 the so the so the separation between those uh, blocks, non-zero blocks, becomes bigger, right? And then let's 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 find out what's going to happen. What's going to happen um, to 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 the Fourier series coefficients, right? Basically, basically, uh, basically to this plot, this plot, right? This plot is uh, on Figure Two, I think. This plot, that's that's this plot. Right. This is for big N equals to nine, right? But let's see what's going to happen if we actually change it to um, change big N to eleven, for example. Let's um, let's change it. Let's change it to eleven. Change it to eleven. And then let's just execute this block. Let's just execute this block. But instead of using red, maybe let's use uh, uh, black, for example. Right. Let's use black. And uh, that's... Uh, that's a comparison between nine and eleven. Big N equals to nine, and big N equals to eleven. Right? Basically, the shape is uh, still kind of similar, but for red you have how many sticks? Nine sticks, right? But for 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 black, you have eleven sticks, right? So basically, you can just uh, try to sort of increase big uh, big N to uh, to even larger numbers, right? We try the nine, try the eleven. Now let's try 21. All right, let's try 21. Let's let's use a, still use a different color. This time let's use a, um maybe maybe green, right? That's green, right? That's green. Even more sticks, 21 sticks, right? And then let's let's try 41. Let's try 41. 41, 41. Right. And then let's use a still different color, maybe magenta, right? Magenta. So if you actually, if you actually sort of look at uh, all the different colors. You can sort of see what's actually the effect of increasing big N, right? What's actually the effect of increasing big N, right? Increasing big N gives you a denser sample of actually a same function. It looks like that. See? The envelope, the envelope still stayed the same, except that the number of sticks that's sampling this envelope is getting denser and denser. Right. So so red sticks have just a nine of it, and then black sticks eleven of it, black sticks, and then green sticks, green sticks, and then magenta sticks, right? Magenta sticks. It's just getting denser and denser, but it's still the shape of the envelope function did not change. See, the shape of the envelope function becomes more and more clear, right? Because you have more and more denser sampling. Right. So 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 now let's if we actually want to uh, go back and look at uh, this particular equation, it means what? It means what? Once we actually increase big n, if we increase big n from 9 to 11 to 21 to 41, the interval 2 pi divided by big n becomes smaller and smaller, right? Smaller and smaller. And then k is still the same set of integers, right? Same set of integers. When when n equals to big when big n equals to nine, then k has nine different values from minus four to positive four. When big n equals to eleven, then k has eleven different values, right? And then as you big, increase big n, the number of k, the number of samples also increases, right? 
So, so the effect of increasing big N is basically reducing the sampling interval in the frequency domain, right? But the but the shape of the function is still the same. The function form didn't change because big N one is the same, right? Because we have fixed big N one to two, we did not actually change big N one. So the shape of this particular function is still the same. It's the same f some function form, but big omega is being sampled using a denser a denser set of points, right? As we increase big N. So so you can imagine you can imagine what's going to happen. What's going to happen if you actually increase big N? To infinity, right? If you actually increase big N to infinity, what's going to happen, right? If you increase big N to infinity, essentially you get an aperiodic wave, right? If big N is really infinity, then this block is located at minus infinity, and then this block is also located at minus a uh, positive infinity, right? And then for any kind of practical application that's looking at a finite duration signal, you have just a one non-zero block that's in the middle, right? So effectively, you are actually retrieving an aperiodic signal, right? If you increase big N to infinity. And then what's going to happen? What's going to happen in the frequency domain, in the Fourier series? The sampling is so dense, is so dense, there's no way to distinguish the different sticks, right? It becomes effectively a continuous function. And that continuous function is this function. And big omega becomes continuous, right? The sampling interval becomes zero. Right. So 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 so, so that's that's how the time and frequency axis can be sort of related, right? Increasing the period in the time domain. Is equivalent to increase the number of samples in the frequency domain. As long as the shape, as long as the shape of one period doesn't change, the function form is not going to change. The function form of the Fourier series is not going to change, right? It's just the sampling is going to become denser and denser, right? And in in the extreme case. When big N becomes infinity, this periodic wave, this periodic square wave, effectively becomes one block of square wave that's aperiodic, right? There's no period because the period is like infinite. And in that case, the Fourier series essentially becomes a continuous function, right? Because the sampling interval has reduced to one over infinity, that's basically zero, right? It essentially becomes a continuous function. Right? So, so how you can, so now we can sort of see the connection. How you, can, how the, how the discrete Fourier series can be connected back into continuous Fourier transforms, right? Just by reducing the sampling interval, uh, increasing the period, increasing the period, and uh, reducing the sampling interval in the frequency domain, right?